the Lord spoke a few very profound things to me that, sh that shook me. Many have thought to be in his perfect will only to find out that they had clearly missed it. There's a lot of people that are floating through the kingdom of God, floating through life, thinking that they are, you know, either in God's will or doing what God wants them to do, and they're a, they're a mile off. And we've got to understand that God has called us to sound a trumpet call for people to understand that the will of God is something that has to be taken very seriously by all of us to understand that God's kingdom God's purposes have to become first in our lives, and it's very easy for us to get, get off track. <clears throat> now it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, now thanks be to God who does what? Always leads us what? In triumph in Christ and through us diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge and every place, that means that God uses you as his specialty perfume in the earth. <laughs> and, and people say, well, what is that? What is that fragrance I smell? That's the fragrance of Jesus. When people see us, they're supposed to uh, hear Jesus. They're supposed to see Jesus. They're supposed to smell Jesus. They're supposed to experience Jesus. Every time people come in contact with us, they need to feel like I've been in the presence of Jesus. And, and uh, it goes on. I want to read just the fir first few ver uh, words in verse 15. For we are to God the what? The fragrance or the aroma of what? Of Christ, of Jesus. So when people come in contact with us, when people come in contact with us, they need to be able to sense Jesus. They need to be able to, to have an aroma of Christ in our lives. And, you know, it is, it is the, the most precious oil that comes from the olives. But you don't know what is inside that olive until it's pressed. Somehow, we try to avoid the pressing in life. We try to avoid the squeeze. But you know, that's how the precious oil is released in your life, is when things are pressure, when there's pressure. Pressure is not always a bad thing. You know, when you look at this guitar right here, and if I could show you a piano, it would be even more. But what a lot of people don't realize is do you have any idea how much tension is on this guitar string right here. Right? There's a, there's a lot of tension on this string. I can tune it down. Right? See? But that's not what it was meant to be. It was meant to be higher. Okay? Of course, if you tighten up too much, it'll snap. But it's designed to handle a lot of pressure. In fact, it's designed to sing under a certain amount of pressure. And you have to understand that the Word of God is filled with warfare. <clears throat> I, I like getting encouragement from other sources. And, uh, you know, people just think, well, I'm just going to just rest and I'm just going to just take it easy. And... Uh, a good dear friend of mine who's an excellent Bible teacher, Brother Guy Dunnick, he says, pajamas equals rest <laughs> and armor equals fight. And he says, I'm still looking for those pajama verses. Yeah, but, but you have to understand, even resting in Christ, that there is a war that has to be won. There's a battle that has to be waged. And, and we, just, we just think it's all about one victory and that's it. The life of David was a life of great battles and great victories. And all this, all this happened. David was, was, excuse the term, picked up by God because he had a heart after God. In, in, in other words, everything happened in David's life because David actually had a heart for God. 
You know, I find out that many times when people are actually really going after God, sometimes those people can seem to have the largest struggles. <laughs> they can seem to have the greatest wars in their life. They can just feel like they, they've, they've been going through so much, but God knows what we can go through. And God has always provided a way, not only of escape, but a way to triumph over every situation that we face. And we have to understand that David went through it. <clears throat> and, you know, we come to David, first of all, he was anointed as a simple shepherd boy. It, he was, he, some, many scholars believe he was 14 or 15, 15 years old when he was anointed to be king. <laughs> Can you imagine a 15-year-old today just being anointed to be king, right? Well, <clears throat> David was then used as just a boy, young man, to kill Goliath. And many people think that David's life just, you know, he became king right after he killed Goliath. My friends, that was only the beginning of his trouble. So many people talk about Goliath. Goliath was great. That is just what put him on the map to become a target for the enemy. And you have to understand that once you begin taking territory for God, once you begin taking territory for the kingdom of God, you are going to be a, a target. <clears throat> and, and that there's things that God is requiring you to do to come up higher. And see, he killed Goliath out of zeal for God. Then he was brought into the king's court. And then he became a target of the king. You see, even though David was innocent, he became the hunted. He became hunted. You have to understand this. David didn't do anything wrong. David was just playing his harp, taking care of sheep. He gets anointed king. All of a sudden, someone's trying to kill him. Don't think it's strange when things start to go strange in your life. Don't think it's strange when there's a fiery trial concerning you. But just because you had to wait in McDonald's for an extra 15 minutes in the drive through line, I'm sorry, that does not qualify as a fiery trial. We, we've got to understand that there are souls on the lines for all eternity. And that we've got to understand that hell right now is screaming out, preach the gospel, tell them to repent, tell them not to come here, tell them that there's no water down here, it's dark here. Hell is crying out right now, and we have to have hell right in front of us. We need to be warning as many people as we can that hell is real, that it is not God's will for them to go there, and that sin will separate you from God, and that you must repent. That message, my friend, if that message gets old or cold upon you, you've got to check your heart because we've got to make sure that we're telling people about Jesus. No, I'm telling you, the only thing we can take with us are people. And we have got to have this, uh, this mindset. Now, Saul, it was very interesting that David was hunted by Saul. He was hunted and, and, and Saul literally tried to throw a javelin at him. And was throwing a javelin at him and he had to run. He had to leave. Sometimes there are people in your life that you're not going to reach right then. In fact, sometimes you need to run for your life. Because the enemy will try to use them to absolutely destroy your life. And you have to say, you know what? I love you and I'm going to pray for you and I respect you. And I'm not even going to slander you. But I can't be around you right now because you're operating in the wrong spirit. Saul was operating in the wrong spirit, trying to kill David. David had two times that he could have killed his enemy. I want you to think possibly about a situation that you had where you could have, you know, gotten yours. Many times God can't trust us <laughs> because, because we've been fighting with a situation, fighting with a person or whatever, and he'll deliver it right into our hands, not so that we can execute judgment, but so that we can execute mercy. And many times people think, oh, God, you know, God delivered my enemy into your hands. Just because God delivers your enemy into your hands does not mean that you're supposed to come against them. 
Many times it means you're supposed to give them ridiculous grace right then and there. Grace that they don't deserve. Grace that they shouldn't get. Grace that, that defies logic and reason. And people say, how in the world could you forgive that? How in the world could you let that go? Because I have, a, I have respect for the calling of God on that person. I have a respect for that person as my brother and sister in the Lord or as a creation of God Almighty. David would not lift up his hand against Saul. That was God's business. David would simply pour out his pain and faith to God through writing Psalms. You know, it is absolutely okay for you to cry. <laughs> it is absolutely for you to feel pain, good, fine for you to feel pain. But God, you have to understand that even in the book of Psalms, David would start out pouring his heart out. Oh God, oh God, oh God. And by the end of the Psalm, he'd say, but God, you are my shield. God, you are my strength. God, you are my portion. You are my deliverer. You are the one I can look to. I look my eyes up. So you can read this, this, this transpiring of events where, where, where David would get down and he would get to uh, almost into depression or despair, and then God would lift him up. Sometimes it's good to pour out your soul before God, but don't stay there. You've got to let faith come alive in your heart. If you don't let faith come alive, then you'll stay in the darkness. But that's why the Bible talks about, and this final scripture we'll be sharing today is about above all. Can you say above all? About everything you do, no matter what you do, you've got to keep your shield of faith out there. You've got to keep the faith of the shield of faith out there, Kyle. You have to have it out there. You don't have the shield of faith out there, you're going to be a sitting duck for the enemy because the enemy is shooting those darts at you, right? He's shooting them. He's, he's, he's trying to get to the people. But you have that shield of faith, and in the Bible days, it was, it was very large. It was oblong in shape, and it would quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. And we've got to understand that we've got to take the shield of faith in these last days against the enemy. We've got to take the fight to the enemy's camp. We're not just waiting for him just to attack us. We're going to go on the defense and we're going to take back everything the enemy has stolen from us. See, now this is what I wanted to share. It was a very, very long divine process from the time when David was promised to be king from the time that he was actually anointed king. David, was, David did not take over the kingdom when he killed Goliath. So, so many people in their mind, they think, David killed Goliath and then he became king. No, he was already, the, he was anointed to be the king, right? You've been anointed to do great things in God, but there is a time of difference when you're anointed to do something before you actually start doing it. <clears throat> It was a many, many years. It wasn't just one year. It wasn't just two years. It was over 10 years that David spent running, that Saul was still in power. It was a process. Now, David did not become king just because he killed Goliath. He became king because he was anointed to be the king, and the fruit of his heart was for the Lord. You see, we don't get anywhere just because of a calling. There's many people who have a calling on their life, and God starts moving, but they don't have the character, and they don't have the fruit of God's love. How many people that we know, they, they were elevated to positions of authority, even in the government, right? And God anointed them. He appointed them, right? They got to where they need to be, right? But the fruit was not in them. And God is far more concerned about the fruit of God in your life. He's much more concerned about that than whatever season that you're in. So many, would they want to be in the springtime season. They want to be in the summer. They want to be in the harvest season. But I'm telling you, fruit is more important than your season. Fruit is more important than your season. God is far more interested in the fruit of what is going on in our hearts. God was saying, hey, David, how's your heart doing there, young man? You got someone after you, don't you? How's your heart? What's going on in your heart? And David was not just uh, by accident. You think of Joseph. Joseph was accused and attacked. So how's your heart doing there, Joseph? God all the time doesn't tempt us, but he tests to see what is in our heart. And where is your breaking point? How, okay, where, wh how bad does the situation get to get before you will cuss? Before you will lose your temper and start using profane language? Where is your breaking point 
of pressure and temptation where you will lust or you'll lie or you'll give into that spirit. Are you hearing what I'm saying? I'm saying you need to, you need to say that there is no more point to where I'm going to break because I'm just going to serve God all the days of my life. There is no breaking point to where you feel, oh, there's this volcano. Uh, uh, uh. No, get rid of the volcano and let the love of God come inside of you. Get delivered of that thing that tries to erupt in your life. And that's what that's, God wanted to make the king in David before David could be king. He wanted to make sure because what God was building in David was something for generations. God is not just trying to get you through this hundred years of your life. He's trying to get you to leave something in this life that is going to be a spiritual legacy that you won't be known for your temper. You won't be known for your shortcomings. You'll be known for someone who is a heart after God. That's what people are going to say about you when you're gone. And what kind of legacy you're leaving. And David could have said, okay, God, you anointed me king. I've killed Goliath. I'm ready. That's what a lot of believers think. They think the high calling of God is just going to just, just come to them just like that. My friend, it is a war. It is a struggle. It is a process of time for you to actually enter into the high calling of God. And very few Christians ever reach the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. I'm telling you the truth right now is that very few people, they, they, they actually enter into the fullness of what God has for them. And we have got to battle. We've got to wage a warfare and understand that the time is now for us to begin to arise and to put on the armor of light. Amen. And so, and so the fruit of God, David didn't become king because he killed Goliath. He, he was anointed king. And then it was the fruit that came forth in his life. The, the emphasis of the fruit of the Spirit has got to come back into the church. You have to understand that, 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 that God brought Saul right to David. David, what are you going to do? You can kill him. You could kill him. He's been trying to kill you. Fair is fair. And David said, no, I will not touch the Lord's anointed. You see... Go to Acts chapter 14. I, I want to share some scriptures with you this morning that I pray will help you in understanding that you have been anointed by the Lord and not to allow the attacks of the enemy to throw you. In fact, many times the attacks can only validate the fact that you are anointed of God because that means you must be doing something right. It doesn't mean we blame the enemy for everything. There are some situations that we get ourselves into just by our own mouth, and the enemy didn't have anything to do with it. Acts chapter 14, verse 22, says that the, these people, the disciples, they were strengthening the souls of the disciples, and they were exhorting them to continue in the faith. And they said this, we must through what? Many what? tribulations enter the kingdom of God. Well, well, let's just put that on our refrigerator. <laughs> we must, through many tribulations, enter the kingdom of God. What does that mean? That means for you to enter into the things that God has called you to go through, you're going to go through a lot of war. You're going to go through a lot of war. You know, I'm a faith person. I believe in faith. I believe in the word of faith. The Bible says take the shield of faith. But realize that, that if you just have faith, right, and you don't understand that you actually are in a war and that there's other elements to the armor of God, right, you've got to understand it's not just about having faith. Faith is one of the elements. But without a love for God, because faith works by love, we'll miss it. David had the love for God down. In 2 Samuel, I want to share a, uh, uh, some scriptures with you. 2 Samuel chapter 1, verse 1. Now it came to pass after the death of Saul, okay, Saul was killed in battle. And I want to say this, it did not happen by David's hand. I'm going to say that again. Saul was killed in battle, but it did not happen by David's hand. 
After the death of Saul, when David had returned from the slaughter of the Amalekites, David stayed two days in Ziklag. On the third day, behold, it happened that a man from Saul's camp came with his clothes torn, dust on his head. So when he came to David, he fell to the ground and he prostrated himself. David said, where have you come from? He said, I've come from the camp of Israel. Then David said, how did the matter go? Please tell me. And he said, the people have fled from the battle. Many of the people are fallen and dead. And Saul and Jonathan are dead too. So David is hearing. He's been running for his life for 10 years from this man. He just now gets the word that he's dead. So David said to the young man, he said, how do you know that Saul and Jonathan, his son, are dead? Then the young man who told him said, as it happened by chance to be on Mount Gilboa, there was Saul leaning on his spear, trying to kill himself. And indeed, the chariots and horsemen followed hard after him. When he looked behind him and he saw me and said, hey, here I am. He said to me, who are you? I said, I'm a Malachite. He said to me again, please stand over me and kill me for anguish has come upon me. But my life still remains in me. So I stood over him and killed him because I was sure that he would not live after he had fallen. Now watch this. I took the crown. Can you say the crown? I took the crown that was on his head and the bracelet that was on his arm, and I've brought him here to you, David. David had been running for 10 years. He could have tried to take matters in his own hand. What happens to David? The crown and the bracelet are brought right to him. He didn't do anything except kept his heart in the right place. But now David could have said, oh, I got the crown. I got the bracelet. He could have put on at his head and go, man, I am king. Woo-hoo, I've got the kingdom. But you see, that was not David's heart. David never sought to be king. He wasn't looking to be a king. He was just looking to love God. He just wanted to build God a house of worship, a tabernacle that his presence would dwell. In fact, in the book of Acts, it says that in the last days, God's going to restore the tabernacle of David. We want to have a church that's open 24-7, hallelujah, that the people of God can come in and worship God anytime that they want. And there's praise and there's prayer and worship going on 24-7. That's our heart. And so, I mean, are you serious about the things of God? That, that's all I believe God is asking his church in this nation today is how serious are you about the kingdom of God? How serious are you? And fine, finally, you know, he, he, he wanted to find this out. Right here, David could have taken the crown and shouted victory over his enemy. Look at David's response, verse 11. David said, hey, uh, he took hold of his own clothes. And what did he do? He tore them. He acted like it was his own father that had been killed. When we have brothers or sisters in the body of Christ that have fallen, or when we have people in our life that have fallen, are we happy when they get what they deserve? Or do we just tear our clothes and weep in anguish over their life? Are you you hearing what I'm trying to tell you this morning? I'm saying you're seeing the makings of a king before he ever got on that throne. You're seeing this is what made David a king, is his heart. He knew he couldn't be with Saul, but yet when he heard that Saul fell, he ripped his own clothes and tore them. But now watch what happened. So did all the men that were with David. You see, it's not just enough for me to get on fire for God. You've got to get on fire for God. It's not enough for people to come to a church and go, wow, that pastor, he sure loves God. It's not about me. It's about you. It's about us. It's about the people of God. Say, what kind of sound is coming forth from the people of God? What kind of sound is coming forth from the church? What kind of sound is God raising up in this church? It says all of David's men, they tore their clothes. They had the same heart as David. That's the heart of a king, is to raise up other people that can have the same burden, the same vision, the same heart to see God do something in this city. I just wish I had a few people that could understand what we're trying to say this morning, is that God is trying to raise up a church in this city with people who have a heart beyond Sunday morning for two hours. 
I, I studied about the Brownsville Revival. I'm telling you, they would go to work at 9 o'clock in the morning at the church, and then they would get off about 4 o'clock, and they would come back at 5 o'clock in the afternoon, and then the service would start about 7 and go to about midnight, four or five nights a week. So you have to under, ask yourself if you really want a revival in this city or if we're just playing games, we're just going to show up on Sunday mornings, and isn't this a great place? Are you hearing what I'm saying? I'm saying God is going to challenge this church to say, do you want revival? Or are you just saying the tickling people's ears, we want revival? Because what revival means is your entire life will completely be revolved around a move of God. Are you hearing what I'm saying? I'm saying it's a serious thing. And God is wanting to, to challenge us to understand that he wants to put the heart of a king on the inside of us. You see, David could have just said, oh, isn't this great? Now, verse 12, they mourned, they, not just David, they, they mourned and wept and fasted until evening for Saul and for Jonathan, his son, for the people of the Lord and for the house of Israel because they had fallen by the sword. See, this is the respect and compassion for the people of God who have fallen. Now look what David does here in verse 13. David said to the young man who told him, where are you from? He said, I'm the son of an alien, a Malachite. Verse 14, so David said to him, how is it that you were not afraid to put forth your hand to destroy the Lord's anointed? Didn't you know that it was God Almighty that anointed Saul? Don't you know that it's God that raises up kings? It's God that raises up leadership. It's God that raises up people in the earth. We're, we're, we are the most complaining bunch of people on the planet. If there's something that we can find to complain about, we will complain about it. <laughs> if we complain about this, we will we'll complain about that. Wives complain about their husbands. Husbands complain about their wives. People complain about the president. People complain about the people in office. They complain about this, complain about this, complain about this, and no prayer. <laughs> So you wonder, why don't things change? Because if you just take the same energy you're doing in complaining and use it for prayer, then something will actually happen. David understood this. David had every right to speak against the king. He had every right to speak against the president. He had killed 85 priests. Can you imagine President Obama getting 85 pastors together and having them slaughtered because they helped somebody? Can you imagine that? That's what Saul did. That is what Saul did. And yet David has an issue because he's coming against the Lord's anointed. It's time for us to break out of the, the slop that people are being told in this generation and understand that God is a holy God and that he wants us to understand that we need to respect those that are in authority. And David said this, because why? Because he was anointed king over Israel. You don't mess with Israel. You don't mess with Israel. And he says this, verse 15, Then David called one of the young men and said, Go near, execute him. He struck him so that he died. So David said, Your blood's on your own head, for out of your own mouth is testified against you, saying, I've killed the Lord's anointed. Then what does David do? He writes a song. <laughs> he writes a song called the Song of the Bow. Verse 17, David lamented with his lamentation over Saul and over Jonathan, his son, and he told him to teach the children of Judah the song of the bow. Indeed, it's written in the book of Jasher. So, so David, you, you think, think about this. He's running for his life from this person, but now he's writing a song about missing him. Are you starting to see the difference of, of the heart of a king and what God wants to do in the earth with you and I? He, he wants us to see things from heaven's perspective. David had such a heart. Now, I want you to understand that David had to withdraw from Saul to save his life, but he never stopped loving him as the anointed of God. He said, that man's anointed of God. He's anointed of God. I'm not going to speak against him. In fact, he might die, but I'll tell you, I'm going to write a song in his honor. That's doing more than just saying, well, God bless his soul. No, he had a heart for him. When, fall, when Saul finally died in battle, David didn't rejoice. The fact that the crown and the bracelet of Saul was literally handed to David, it still was not time for David to take the kingdom. You realize that even after Saul died, that he still was not the king of Israel. You realize that. So you have all these years from David killing Goliath, 
running for his life. Saul is finally dead, and people would think, oh, I guess David's the king. No, David's not the king yet, still. I want to throw this in here. We cannot compare ourselves with others. We must all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 9, it says, Therefore we make it our aim, whether present or absent, to be what? Well-pleasing to who? To the Lord. For we must all, let's read it in context, everyone. Let's read it in context. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each may, what? Receive the things done where? In the body, according to what? According to what he has what? Done. Whether good or bad. Is this the Word of God? Is this the New Testament? Am I speaking the truth this morning? I, I, feel, I feel there's victory coming forth in this place today. <laughs> Why? Because victory comes in the midst of repentance. Joy comes in the midst of repentance. Proverbs 24, verse 17, gives us a beautiful illustration of why David was the way he was. Do not rejoice when your enemy falls. And do not let your heart be glad when he stumbles, lest the Lord see it. And it displeases him. He turns away his wrath. Now, though Saul was dead, David still did not become king. He simply started in the land of Judah. He asked God, God, what do I need to do? God said, I want you to go to Judah. You know what I like to call the land of Judah? The land of praise. Judah means praise. What does Judah mean? It means praise. It means David still wasn't king. Anointed king, beat Goliath, ran for his life. Saul is dead. He has the crown. He has the bracelet. But yet he's still not king. God told him, I want you to go to Judah. So he started in the land of praise. He still never changed who he was. Saul never changed. We hear about politicians that change as soon as they get in office or people. Money can do it to people. Someone can give you a check for a million dollars and people could change overnight. They become a totally different person because of money. Or you can have someone that has a lot of money and you can take all the money away from them and they become a totally different person overnight. Money should never control how we live our life. We should be living our life based on the joy of the Lord, based on bringing souls into the kingdom of God. So David began in the land of Judah, the land of praise. Now he became king over that tribe for several years before he was to rule Jerusalem. Does anyone know uh, who was the uh, new king? Anyone know? It was Saul. Did you know Saul had more than one son? He had more than one son that came in. A Shibosheth. And uh, David uh, asked the Lord where to go. Now let's pick it up in 2 Samuel 2, verse 4. This is where David was anointed king of Judah, not over Israel. The men of Judah came, and they anointed David over the house of Judah. They told David, saying, the men of Jabesh Gilead were the ones who buried Saul. So David sent messengers to the men of Jabesh Gilead and said to them, you're blessed of the Lord, for you have shown this kindness to your Lord, to Saul, and have buried him. And now may the Lord show kindness and truth to you. I will repay you this kindness because you have done this thing. Now, therefore, let your hands be strengthened and be valiant. But your master Saul is dead. And also the house of Judah has anointed me king over them. You look at this. David is still honoring Saul even after his death. <laughs> you learn how to honor people no matter what. David had learned a lesson not to speak against Saul. He, he learned that lesson early on in life. I think it's because he valued the anointing that was upon his life. See, sometimes we lose sight of the fact of just how anointed you are, of just how much God has poured upon your life. And when God has taken that anointing, he's putting it on your life. He wants you to protect that anointing. 
He, he wants you to walk in that anointing. He wants you to move in the glory of God and in the presence of God. It's real hard to do that if you're attacking somebody else. It's really hard to do that if you're accusing somebody else. And God all the time is trying to make us the king that he's created us to be. He's trying to release that. Now Saul's son who now was reigning was Ashibosheth. Boy, that's a tongue twister. 2 Samuel chapter 4, verse 5 says, Then the sons of Ramon, the Berethite, Rechab, and Bana, they set out and they came about the heat of the day to the house of Ashibosheth, he was the king, who was lying on his bed at noon. They came there all the way to the house to get wheat, as though to get wheat, and they stabbed him in the stomach. Then Rechab and Bana, his brother, escaped. For when they came into the house, he was lying on his bed in his bedroom. Then they struck him and killed him. They beheaded him and took his head and were all night escaping through the plain. Now watch this, verse 8. Now what I want you to see here is God is, was David's defense through this whole thing. David never raised his hand uh, directly against any of these kings, even though God had delivered him. Verse 8, then they brought the head of the Shibosheth to David at Hebron and said to the king, here is the head of a Shibosheth, the son of Saul, your enemy, who sought your life, and the Lord has avenged the king this day of Saul and his descendants. Boy, many people would just be excited. Look at that. God delivered me. He delivered the enemy's head right into my lap. He gave me the crown. He gave me the bracelet. He's done all these things for my life. You think David would be thrilled. Watch what David said, verse 9. But David answered Rechab and Bana, his brother, the sons of Ramon the Berethite, and said to them, As the Lord lives, who has redeemed my life from all adversity. See, David acknowledged it was God that redeemed his life. But when someone told me, saying, Look, Saul is dead, thinking to have brought me good news, I arrested him and had him executed in Ziklag. The one who thought I would give him a reward for his news. How much more when wicked men have killed a what? Righteous person in his own bed. Therefore shall I not now require his blood at your hand and remove you from the earth. So David commanded the young men. They executed them, cut off their hands and feet, hung them by the pool in Hebron. But they took the head of a Shibosheth and buried it in the tomb of Abner in Hebron. Do you see what David is doing here? All David knew how to do was to honor people. I remember when I worked, one of the best men I ever worked for was a man of honor. And he treated people with dignity and respect. And it didn't matter if they were a janitor or somebody that uh, was making a lot of money. He made sure that he taught people how to give them honor and dignity and respect. Who, who, are you, who do you have in your life this morning that you need to honor? For some people, it's just their spouse. Do you know that many people speak worse to their own family members than they would speak to a total stranger? Did you know that people would speak, the things that people would say to somebody is worse than what they would speak to a complete stranger that they've never met before in their whole life? Well, it's mighty quiet in this Presbyterian church this morning. You see, now I want you to understand that David had to get from where he was at to his promised land. We all, please hear me. We all have a promised land that God has promised for us. And I'm not talking about heaven. I'm talking about right here, right on the earth, God has a promised land that he has established for you to possess. He, he, has, a, he has a place that he wants you to conquer in the name of Jesus. There are people that need to be saved that are in your life. There are neighbors that need to be witnessed to. There are lives that need to be changed. There are homes that need to be transformed. And God wants to use you. You are not, some, you know, the, the thing of it is, is you, many people you say, well, what are you going to do in heaven? It's all based on what you do down here. What you are going to be doing in eternity 
depends on what you do right now. What you do in eternity based on right now. And that's why we encourage people, if you're planted in this house, put your hand to the plow. Don't look back. Let God plug you into where you need to be plugged into and the lives of the people and just let God begin to minister that. And he's going to make sure that you do what you're called to do. He's going to establish you for victory. You just put him first and keep your heart in the right place. They came and made David king over all Israel. And David's enemies were not destroyed by David's own hand. He just trusted that the Lord would be his shield. That God would be his shield. I think sometimes we try to take matters into our own hand, thinking that we have to change a situation in order to make God our shield. You know, I just want you to remember, every time that you face a struggle or you face an obstacle, remember that God brought David, David had the head of his enemies brought to him. He had the, he had the bracelet and the crown brought to him. David didn't have to make anything happen. If we could learn to trust God with what he has for us, the victory and the joy would come. I had this thought the other day, you know, many people want joy in their life, but do you know that joy comes from loving God? And you know, loving God comes through obeying God. And do you know many people miss the connection? You go out in the street right now. You go interview people going into a rated R movie right now. Do you love God? You, you, you talk to someone in the midst of a tirade against someone else. Do you love God? Of course I love God. Right? <laughs> beep, 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 beep. Loving, saying I love God and showing God my love for him are two different things. And God has called the church of Jesus Christ to say, stop saying you love God and show it. We say that in the world, don't we? Don't tell me, don't tell me, talk is cheap, don't we? We say talk is cheap. We want to see the goods. And my friends, I know that God wants to baptize us in joy, but I'm telling you, joy is a fruit. We got some farmers in here, right? You got to plant something before it's going to grow, right? People just want God to zap them with some joy. My friend, it comes out of obedience. You got the fruit of the Spirit. Love is the first one, and then joy follows. So in other words, the more you walk out your love for God, I tell you, this is the message that the church in 2014 needs to hear is that it is not enough to just tell God you love him. He wants you to show him. It is not enough for just to say we love God. Oh, I love God and he loves us. No, well, he loves us so much he did something for us. He sent us his very best. And we've got to learn to give God our very best. You know, the shield of God is our defense. The, the sword is how we advance, but the shield of God is our defense. And I want you to, we're going to share just a few more scriptures about what David had to say about the shield. Now, no, we have the shield of faith in the New Testament, but I want you to understand that the Lord himself is our shield. He's our shield. He's our buckler. In Psalms chapter 3, verse 3, David said, but you, O Lord, you are a what? a shield for me, my glory, and the one who lifts up my head. You are my shield. When we begin to let the Lord be our shield in life, he will protect us. In Psalm chapter 5, verse 11, it says, but let all those who rejoice put their, who put their trust in you, let them ever what? Shout for joy. Why? Because you defend them. Let those also who love your name be joyful in you. See, David was joyful because he knew the Lord would be his defense. He didn't have to go around defending himself. Sometimes people are talking and you say, and they, they react, and you say, wow, you sure are defensive, right? You sure are defensive. You don't have to defend yourself if the Lord Jesus is defending you. You don't have to defend yourself. I'm telling you today, you do not have to defend yourself. You just simply let the Lord God be your shield. Let him be your buckler. Let him be the one that lifts you up 
out of the miry clay. And it says, be joyful in you. Verse 12, for you, O Lord, will bless the righteous. With favor, you will surround him as, as with a shield. God's joy upon our life is what he's looking for. You see, we are uh, enforcing the victory of the cross in every area of our life. You know, even though David had that crown delivered him, he knew that it was in God's time. He knew that it was in God's time. There are people that are in this room that if you knew the high calling of God, if you could see where God has called you to be, right, is much greater than you could imagine. But David knew that it was a process. Can you just say process? It's a process to get there. And you know what a lot of Christians say? I don't want the process. I just want to go to church and just pay tithes and just live my life. And God said, okay, that's what you'll have. Don't let anyone take your crown. There's a crown that has been laid up for us, my friends, that Jesus himself is going to give us. What is your crown going to look like? I got news for you. We are not all going to have the same rewards. I think that's the biggest lie that's been told to this generation. They thought they could say a prayer when they were young and just live their life however they want. You just say a prayer and everything's okay. No, we've got to understand that God wants us to take this shield that he's placing upon our lives. In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 16, it says, we shared this earlier, above all, taking the what? The shield of faith with which you will be able to quench. That word quench means to extinguish, like you've got this fire extinguisher here, right? Well, this fire extinguisher will put a fire out really quick, but I want you to know the shield of faith will quench. It will extinguish every dart of the enemy. It doesn't say that it will extinguish some of the darts of the enemy. People that get under attack need to lift up the shield of faith. If you have, I'll say it this way. If you will have the shield of faith, you will not get harmed. Christians get harmed when they take the shield of faith down. And instead of having the shield of faith, they start accusing someone else. They start blaming someone else for their problems. They start accusing God. They start getting mad at God. Boy, that's a smart thing to do. Get mad at God. I've ever heard someone say that. I was mad at God. I just stand there. Then who are you going to pray to? Jesus is doing something supernatural in our midst. And again, the shield is our defense, but the sword is how we advance. The final scripture in Psalm 1611, David said, You will show me the path of life. And in your presence is fullness of joy.